Hi, I'm Brother Guy Consolmagno. I'm the director of the Vatican Observatory. We've got an outfit in Castel Gandolfo in the Pope's Summer Gardens, but we also have a telescope here in Tucson, Arizona. Arizona is a fantastic place to do astronomy. It's got clear skies, it's got dry skies. In the evenings, when the clouds go away, you can see the sky like no place else in North America. And it's a community of many wonderful astronomers. We follow all of the astronomy going on in the world, from the discovery of life to dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter and dark energy, now there is an interesting topic. What's the difference? Well, dark matter is material that we think exists in the galaxies that causes the stars to orbit differently than you would expect them to orbit if they were only being pulled on by the stars you can actually see. Dark energy is completely different from dark matter. Where dark matter tries to pull things in and pull things around, dark energy pushes things out. When we observe the expansion of the universe, we not only see that clusters of galaxies are moving apart from each other, and the farther away you look, the faster they seem to be moving, but more than that, this expansion, one galaxy cluster moving away from another galaxy cluster, is actually accelerating. It's not just expanding, but it's expanding faster and faster and faster. There's got to be a source of energy that causes this expansion. We're here at the Redemptorist Retreat Center in Tucson, Arizona. We've just been having a faith and astronomy workshop with a number of pastors and educators from Catholic parishes around the world. A lot of questions have come up, topics that people have heard, words that people have heard lots of times in discussion of modern cosmology. Dark energy, dark matter. What the heck is dark matter. Let's start right. with that. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I suppose, uh, you know, the question really got interesting in the 1600s when Johannes Kepler first told us how planets orbit the sun. Kepler found that planets that are farther away from the sun are moving more slowly than planets that are closer than the sun. We wondered the same thing about our own galaxy. Are the suns, the stars that are close to the Milky Way, close to the center, moving faster than the ones where we're located, which is about two-thirds of the way out? and are the ones, the very, very edges of our galaxy moving more slowly. And what we found was a complete surprise. Not only is that velocity of these stars not moving like Kepler had seen that they moved for our solar system, but in fact all the stars are moving at the same speed. That doesn't make any sense. No, it does. It, it was astonishing. <laughs> it was astonishing. And it still is astonishing. Who is the person who actually measured the, the motion of the stars around the center of the galaxy. A great astronomer called Vera Rubin, who discovered what we now call the flat rotation curve. If it's flat, then it's not a curve. It's a flat, <laughs> then it's not a curve. It's a curve that's flat, that's right. We expected it to be a curve, which is what Kepler had predicted. And instead, what we see is that the motion, the speed, the velocity of all the stars in the Milky Way are exactly the same, about 220 kilometers. They progress every second, including so our own sun. So maybe that just means that our understanding of Kepler's laws doesn't work for the galaxy, that maybe gravity is different at those distances. Well, that is a possible interpretation, indeed. An alternative, which is one that probably scientists are leaning more towards now, is the idea that there might be some extra matter, something other than stars and the gas and dust from which they're made, that we can't see, but we can feel the effects of it, because it is somehow guiding these stars to have the same velocity at all distances. How would that stuff have to be distributed in our galaxy? We think that probably that dark matter would have to be pretty much everywhere in the galaxy and probably growing more and more towards the outskirts of the galaxy itself. Um, but we, we have yet to see it directly or know what this dark matter is. Is there any other effect besides the motions of stars that would show up if this dark matter actually existed? Yeah, well, there, there certainly are. We've also seen evidence that a great mass of matter can will also bend the light of any object behind it. So we know with our own sun, for example, that another object behind it, like say another star, which shines very brightly, will have its light bent by the sun en route to us here at Earth. And we've measured that. We've known about that for about a hundred years now. That was a prediction of Einstein, which turned out to be right and made him quite famous. Turns out that dark matter can also do that. Dark matter can also have that effect of taking the light of an object behind it and bending that light around it. So we see that bending of light, but then when we look at what's doing the bending, we don't see anything there. 
or we don't see nearly enough stuff to account for the amount of bending we see. We, we, we do see a little bit of light in most cases, but then we don't see the extra mass that, that it has to have to make that effect, yeah. Wasn't there a case where there were two galaxies that collided with each other? And, and how does that work? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so we think there is a, there's a cluster which we now call the bullet cluster, which you, you may have heard of, which there are two clusters of galaxies, each one having a dozens and dozens of individual galaxies of 100 billion stars each, a true heavyweight of the universe, then engages in a direct collision with another galaxy in one of the most gigantic attacks did they, did of I all time. Did it hit and explode or something? Oh no, well, some parts did and some parts didn't. So somewhat surprisingly, all these 100 billion stars didn't hit and explode. For the most part, they kind of went right past each other and then turned around because they were pulled by the mutual gravity and made another pass. But what did smack was all the gas. There's a great deal of gas as well, which would be the future ingredients of stars okay. for each galaxy. That smacked and produced a bunch of new stars. But in addition to this gas and then all those stars, there's also this additional dark matter that we were talking about. And that dark matter does not interact very well with itself. It did not smash. It, it also just passed right through each other. And so it seems to be keeping going even though the stars are being stuck together. Exactly. And you can tell that it's there because of the way it's bending the light and of we things see, And we see evidence for that. Yeah, we see evidence for that. So it's actually there. It yes. really sounds like it's actually there. It really sounds like it's there, yes. And, and it behaves differently than, you know, it behaves differently than the rocks which would be moving back and forth the way the stars do. It's a different kind of stuff yes, than ordinary matter. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We can't see it, but we know it's there because we know how it affects the things we can see. Right, we see it indirectly. So that's dark matter. Yes. Now the other phrase we hear is dark energy. What do we know about dark energy? We do suspect that the dark energy is taking up even a more substantial part of the effective mass of the universe than even the dark matter. And then the dark matter is even more massive than the material that we're made out of. So we're really the minority matter. What, what, what are the proportions that people usually come up with? Well, the amount of matter that we're made up with is probably approximately 3% or so of the total amount of matter that we can account for. So it'd be very interesting to know what the other 97% is, and that's, that's one of our goals in this science. Doesn't this bother you as a scientist to say that after studying and spending these zillions of dollars and all of this equipment and all of these telescopes, and we wound up knowing less we're, we're discovering the universe is much stranger and, and we're not even beginning to understand what's out there compared to what we thought we understood 100 years ago. It feels like we're going backwards. <laughs> is that the case? Um, no, I really, really don't think so at all. The, I think the importance there is that we're gaining knowledge by, by knowing that we're just a small part of something much larger. Are we ever going to come to a point where we know it all? Well, ah. it's finally understood, well, that, a theory of everything? Yeah, well, we're certainly learning more and more each year, but if this is the amount of what you need to know to know everything, you know, you can ask, what, what fraction are we there now? Are we here? Are we here? Are we here? And that's a fascinating question. Will we ever get to the end or not? I mean, this may be just the, the fascinating juncture at which we, I have to ask you this question <laughs> as a Jesuit. Well, I'll tell you what my dad tells me. Yes. Uh, he had a wonder, marvelous way of explaining it. He says, knowledge is like an island. The more you know, the bigger the island. But the shoreline is the boundary between what you know and the ocean of what you don't know. And the bigger the island is, the longer the shoreline. Mm -hmm. So the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Yes. Now, the scary thing is you can apply that to other things like the spiritual life. The better a person you are, the more the island of goodness is, the longer the shoreline where you realize how much you still have to do to yes. be a better person yet. And so if you think you know everything, it's because your island is really, really small. And if you think you're a really, really good person, it's because your island, I don't want to go there. That's scary. <laughs> what are the implications for a believer? For someone who believes that God created the universe, well, there's the obvious point that this stuff, this dark matter, we didn't know about until about 40 years ago. This dark energy we didn't know about until 10 years ago. The universe is full of stuff that we're only discovering now. If you came back and asked me in 100 years' time, I would probably be talking about things that we have no idea 
here in the beginning of the 21st century. That's the way that science progresses. The more we know, the more we discover there is to be known. The more we know, the more we realize that our simple explanations that worked when I was a student probably are inadequate. But isn't that the way our faith life works? God is there. As we learn more about the universe and as we learn more about God, we realize that what we understood may have been true, but it is a poor understanding of what's really out there. Even take something as simple as God as the Father, God as the Creator. You've got a very different idea of what it means to be a father when you're six years old than you do maybe when you're a father yourself. Our understanding of the universe and our understanding of God are growing and in some ways accelerating, just like the universe itself is growing and accelerating.